There are some basic, and I mean basic rules of etiquette to observe in the courtroom. Some of them you learn in law school. Come on. Some of them you learn in kindergarten. I'm Josh Sanford, I'm America's attorney. I've been a lawyer for 21 years. I've helped over 20,000 clients. I make videos helping you understand the context of legal stories that you hear in the news so that you understand our world a little bit better. Almost everyone had their eyes on the TV and the Waukesha trial and Daryl Brooks's stellar pro se performance as the world's best lawyer. Well, today, a real lawyer reacts to the uncontrolled failures of a fake lawyer. If you are not already subscribed, and most of you are not, now's the time. Seriously, like, right? Okay, you did it, we're good. Now let's just jump right into this. Okay, so you need to know the setup. There are some clips of Daryl Brooks losing his whoop, and I haven't seen these clips, but I have been told that I am saving the craziest one from the trial for the very end, but I cannot wait to see just how mad this madman acted. Three, I believe that these photographs are designed to make a suggestion to the jury that Erica Patterson is a bad mom. I think that that's what the defendant is trying to do. And if we're gonna go down that road, then we would be forced to counter that claim. First of all, it doesn't make her an incredible witness, if it's even true. And second of all, if we go down that road, we would be forced to counter that claim by pointing out that not only does the defendant not live with the child in question, he doesn't live with any of the other children that he has, he impregnated Erica Patterson when she was a minor in Nevada, and for doing so, he was convicted of statutory sexual seduction pled guilty in March of 2007 to that felony offense and is a sex offender on the registry as a result. So if there's any causation that would lead to Erica Patterson being a bad mom, Mr. Brooks has a direct role in that causation. And that's furthermore, I'll to that I'm not because done. that's a lie. Let him at finish. The end of the day, Let him we, finish. We're gonna open the door on that. No, since he wanna make a record and not be accurate, so let's be ac accurate all on the record since you think you know so much. Once so again, we can Mr. open Brooks the door on. We can open the door on how old she told me she was when we met. We can ask that question he too. He is then. over the top animated right now. Do you know that, that? Mr. Brooks? I'm ordering you to sit down and to let the state no, finish. No, no, I'm not going to sit here and let somebody be inaccurate on the record and lie on the record. Right. Under Illinois versus Allen, I've warned him repeatedly. He's being removed from the courtroom, um, and you know what? You can see. Emotions are running, they're running high right now. And here's why. Some really bad things are being said about Mr. Brooks. In fact, I'm hoping that my editors bleep some of them out, to be honest. We're talking about courtroom decorum today. First of all, I didn't think I was gonna do this in today's video, but I want to give him a thumbs up for standing up while addressing the court. Posture is a big part of how attorneys and sometimes litigants show respect to the court. So when you address the court, you stand, that's fine. Interestingly, at the beginning of the clip, the prosecutor was sitting down. Now, we didn't see this, but I can assume, and you should assume, that the judge gave permission to the attorney to stay seated while making his argument, perhaps because it was a lengthy argument, but the jury is out of the room, and so it's not as formal. But the lawyer is sitting, Brooks jumps up and starts talking. Now, one of the rules of courtroom decorum is one at a time, okay? There's a couple reasons for that. One is so that you can show respect to the person who's talking, and that's if it's a witness, a lawyer, or obviously the judge, right? There's also a more technical reason, which is that there is a court reporter at every proceeding, in every courtroom in America. Now, a court reporter may not be a human anymore. I've been in some courtrooms where it is an AI and it's being recorded and transcribed by a computer system, but it's a court reporter all the same, and that transcription is checked by a human who's listening to the recording. But if two people are talking at once, it is really, really hard to transcribe that. The judge says something like one at a time or stop talking and he's like, no, he's not having any of it. Rude, you're not allowed to do that. You are not allowed to do that. Now, then what's crazy is the judge tells him to stop and he says, no. Decorum is one thing, right? Direct disobedience of a judge, defiance of a directive of a judge is actually a type of contempt. And it's in-person contempt. And the rules that govern how you can get yourself into jail or in-person contempt there in the courtroom are far simpler than the rules that govern out-of-court contempt. Because the judge 
does not need to rely on anyone's testimony to see that you are disobeying her. She's watching, she sees that you're disobeying, and she can just straight up put you in jail. Now there's a limit on that. You can't go to jail for a year, you can't go to jail for five years. In most states, the limit is 90 days. There might be some that are less than that. I have a feeling that Brooks may end this trial going away for longer than 90 days, but not for contempt. Let me dial that back. We're just gonna take an early lunch, one hour, we'll be back, and uh, unless he brings that letter. She's so patient go. with him. It is wow. inadmissible, she will not be questioned, and under 906.11, I will yeah, you declare the cross-examination closed. You where, you what Thank you, we're in recess, one hour. Time, right? huh. Get your facts straight. Oh. So let's, let's open the door on all of it then so we can get all of it on the record. Since you think you know so much, did, did you know she said she was 18 when I met her? Did you know oh. that? Oh, so this is not on the record, right? The judge has said, we're breaking for lunch, so it's not on the record. He can't help himself. What's he doing? He is kind of confessing to certain elements of certain crimes. Wow. I don't care what you believe fully. All right. It's not a game. We. I don't take I this as a game. That's what, that's, what nobody, that's what nobody, that's what nobody, you don't gotta explain nothing to me. Do you want that's what you don't understand. You think you that this is a whole game to, to me? Question? This is not a game to me, Your Honor. Not, nothing about this is a joke. I never That's what y'all don't joke. understand. But there's and it's unfair, it's unfair, on. and it's disrespectful to me that you think I would come in here purposely and treat this like a joke or a game. I never said it was a what joke. Type, what, type, what, type of, what type of statement is that? Mr. Your life is not on the line. I have to pause it right there because he just pointed at the judge. I've been in court for thousands of days. Literally, I've been in courtrooms on multiple thousands of days. Never have I ever wagged my finger at a judge. On the other hand, Daryl Brooks and I, we don't got a lot in common. Receding hairlines and American citizens. And you think that I, I think this is funny? I don't think it's funny whatsoever. So I, so I think, Your Honor, with all due respect, I think you so should show some respect. So we're gonna take five minutes. <laughs> oh, no, no, no! I have said that I think that the judge showed a heroic level of patience in this trial. Her patience is actually like, it's way more impressive than I thought. Judges tell litigants who don't have lawyers, hey, warning, I'm gonna hold you to the same standard that I would hold a lawyer. They say, you have to know the rules of evidence, you have to know the rules of civil procedure. I'm not gonna cut you any slack. They always say that. The reality is, most judges, they cut a lot of slack to litigants. And this guy, I mean, this, <laughs> like, you have to just kind of close your eyes and imagine, what would this be like if this were a lawyer saying this to the judge? I mean, you would actually be disbarred. You'd be at least suspended. You can't talk to a judge this way. It doesn't happen when you are a lawyer. But when you are your own lawyer and you're pro se, you get away with some stuff. Actually, I think the judge may have a premonition about how this all ends. And maybe she feels like it's not that big a deal if he kind of shows his darker side during the trial. I'm a grown man with grown kids. Don't nobody, ain't nobody gonna talk to me like that. Nobody. I don't have a problem with doing what you ask me to do. Not tell me. Just like when I Did ask you, you about subject matter jurisdiction that you have yet to prove on the record. But somehow I'm being intentionally disruptive. Come on, man. Stop. Just stop it. Jury's right. coming out. All right for the jury. Not gonna work. What is so weird to me is that people who work inside the courtroom, particularly lawyers, the judge is a person, right? She's a woman, right? She's there, she's a human, right? She has a head, she has two arms, she's just there being a human being. But in the transaction that a courtroom is, a judge is not a person. A judge is the representative of all of the power of one third of the government of the state. The judge is a human embodiment of the state of Wisconsin. They are not equals. The judge and Mr. Brooks are not people having a conversation. She is there as the human representative of the state of Wisconsin, particularly the judicial branch. He is so, so, so far outside the bounds of understanding the actual dynamics between them. He's saying, you're not gonna disrespect me, you have to prove something. The judge doesn't have to prove anything. The judge is the one who decides what has been proven. It's just a very gross, 
misapprehension of what the dynamics are in their relationship. One of his failures is that when he looks at the judge, he sees a human, but what he should see is the government, like with a capital G kind of. You don't make a record so that I can make a ruling. It threw people off the loop. They weren't ready for it. They scared of it. That's what it is. Come on, man. Mr. Brooks. Come on, man. Stop. When you, you Stop are, it. You aren't Stop even it. letting me ask Stop it. You're a public servant, Your Honor. I, I respect your courtroom. I you respect do. you. You're a public servant, though. Your job is to be the referee. Is it or is it not? You stated so yourself on record that your job is being the umpire. You're right. I asked. Yes, you can be excused. My apologies. My apologies too, but it needs to be some truth, especially when we're talking about stuff that didn't even happen, but they're allowed to get on the stand and say that it happened when they know it didn't happen. So let me make, I'm going to make a record about what this he's is referring ridiculous, to man. in count 77. <sighs> He's talking over the judge. We learn in kindergarten. Some of us learn before kindergarten that you can't do that. There was an objection uh, to questions regarding uh, cross-examination. So the objections were by the state. One had to do with possible, there was questioning about possible testimony with his niece and nephew and then the jail cell search issues. So Mr. Brooks, you asked the questions. Um, the state had objected. Since you're the proponent of what would presumably come in through the testimony of uh, Detective Casey, uh, what is your offer of proof as to why I should allow Detective Casey to come back on the stand and testify about his interaction? I believe it was with your mom and possible testimony of your niece and nephew. Um, it, it don't matter with Detective Casey. He, he's off the stand. He's not going back on the stand too. No, but I told you I would recall no, I, him. I, I wanted to take it up rebut, outside the presence of the jury. To, how do I supposed to know? So are you withdrawing that, sir? How am I supposed to know? I, I think I deserve a chance to rebut what was just said. I think I deserve that much if it's a fair trial. What information do you want to provide to me I'll, about that last exhibit? Okay, before he does whatever he's about to do. She's asking him, do you want to make an offer of proof? Here's what an offer of proof is. Actually, I just remembered that he used to ask, uh, I mean, he, he said in the trial over and over, uh, what's the grounds for the sustain? What's the grounds for the sustain? Okay, an offer of proof. When someone wants to offer testimony and then the other party objects and the court rules in favor of the objector and so the proof is not coming in. If that issue matters so much to the person who was going to offer the evidence, in order to get a meaningful review of the refusal of the court to let that evidence come in, there has to be something called an offer of proof, which is essentially when you offer what that document or t or witness would have said. So like, let's say that you have a piece of paper, this one, and this piece of paper says that the children were in bed by four, no, that's late, by 8 p.m. And you wanna offer it, and the judge says, no, we're not letting that email in because we don't know who wrote it. And the, and the objection to this coming in is sustained, not substained, but Sustained. In order to preserve your objection for appeal, you have to say what that evidence would have been. If you don't make that offer of proof, you've lost your right to appeal on that issue. About what last exhibit? I'm talking about the the, the audacity of the prosecution to just put that on the record when it's stating un, it's untrue. I don't know what you're talking about. What's untrue? We just heard her talk for five, ten minutes straight. Now don't nobody know what I'm talking about. I don't there was know a specifically reference made to, what you're talking about, There was a reference about, made to what I'm supposed to know about the evidence stacking up and this and that as if that has any bearing on what I still think and what I'm still going to present. It doesn't. Well, that's not what we're talking about at the moment. I, I made a ruling she, on she's an She's been laughing and, and making comments under her breath the whole the time during the whole trial, and I never said nothing. I don't know what's being said, but I can tell that it's directed <laughs> towards me. I'm not, a, I'm not an idiot. I'm not an idiot, he says. And the prosecutor did not object. I yeah. haven't made any I, of those observations, I, I didn't sir. Say but you. I've observed. I didn't say you, Your Honor. No, no, no. But what I've observed for, for her, is for as... her, Listen, please. Go ahead. For her to sit there and try to play it off as if she's not referencing to me, she must think I'm an idiot. Nobody that is very that, disrespectful to me. I haven't said anything about that until today. She's done it numerous times. What are you talking about? I don't her know what you're laughing saying. under her breath. Her trying to cover up the microphone so they can laugh and hee hee and kee kee kee. That they've been doing that the whole time. 
I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything about it. I have not noticed that. What I notice are three attorneys who cover up the microphone so that they're not heard when they're conferring with each other about evidentiary issues or about testimony. So why is it always laughing and, and, and giggling? I haven't with noticed that. that other than the one thing you pointed out. Well, we have, we have cameras. That's what the cameras are for. Let's refocus our attention on what we're here for. And that's okay. I know I'm not, I cannot let that one go. He just said that the cameras are in the courtroom, not to publicize the trial, to the United States and beyond, but instead to catch lawyers giggling with each other? I, I, don't, I don't think that's why the cameras are there. I, I don't think that's why. I, I could be wrong. Brian, yeah, I, I take that you as, have anything I you want to put on as, the record. I'm putting it on the record as as if I get a chance. No, you need to let me finish. As it relates to the video, and my decision to admit it. She just admitted that she just now came with the exhibit. It was not, and she just said, she just made it an exhibit. It that was not an exhibit before she made it one. So do you have some legal basis, sir, for your position? Because I'm not What do I need any. legal basis for when she just admitted on the record that she just made this exhibit up no, right she now? Didn't. That is a complete mischaracterization. Sure, she did not. That's what, so she Create wasn't implying that by saying that she could she pull anything out of her suitcase. So that's a figure of During, speech. Okay, so what right? is it implying to? What would that be implying to? As attorney, how would anyone, how would I'm anyone in my position? I'm moving on because you're not providing would, me with any how legal any, basis I didn't even finish, you, to, you told me that I can make the record. I'm intent to make the well, record. Sir, as it relates to the video and my decision to admit it, do you I have just any said that you didn't even let, let me finish. finish. You're not letting me finish. You didn't let me finish either, Your Honor. Because you're not providing providing me. But how do, you, rant, how do you know you're I wouldn't get to that if, if I didn't finish? You're not providing me with anything from a legal basis for which I would consider changing my mind. So the state's withdrawn their request to play the audio. This whole idea that you just badger the judge is so beyond the pale. Like I told you earlier, she's giving him some slack. I'm telling you, they don't let lawyers do this in courtroom. Not in any courtrooms that I've been in. I've been in like probably like 50 different courthouses in 10 or 15 states. I, I just, <laughs> I am, uh, my mind's a little bit blown. You know who else might have had his mind blown? Daryl Brooks. He's acting like it. I've already made a ruling on that. You're questioning the ruling. You're not asking me to reconsider it based on any legal there basis. There should be a legal, a legal reconsideration of it. Then you need to provide me with the legal basis for that, sir. So I'm supposed to just come off that with the top, off the top of my head? Yes. No, I mean, she's saying, if you want to argue about my ruling, if you don't like it, tell me why I'm wrong on the law. And he's like, I'm just supposed to say that? I'm just supposed to know that? And the answer is, well, a lawyer would, or you don't just like start shouting about stuff that you don't like in trial. You have arguments, meaning legal theories, justifications, principle-based persuasion, not just the shouty, yelly. I mean, you're not making a YouTube video. That's ridiculous. You're representing yourself. It's not ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So I was supposed to, I was supposed to already come in here this morning and say, oh, a video is going to be shown off the fly at the, at the drop of a hat. Let me try to find some legal thing to combat. Mr. How am Brooks, I supposed to do you that? Open, the bottom line is you open the door to it the playing it of that video. We're not talking about and the video no was doors. previously provided to you during discovery. We're not talking about Absolutely opening the doors. We're talking no. about being fair. So the judge says, you open the door to the introduction of that video. And he says, we're not talking about opening doors. We're talking about being fair. Now, she kind of got a little gotcha moment there with him because opening the door is as, as colloquial as that sounds, that's legalese. Opening the door means that a piece of evidence or a topic that could be discussed in evidence, which was otherwise not an appropriate part of a case, if the party to whom that topic is unfair opens the door, meaning that they bring it up, that they introduce something that makes it more fair to come, for it to come in, then the whole thing comes in. So if you if there's a topic that you don't want the jury to hear about, you don't bring that topic up in front of the jury because once you do, 
then the other side is gonna get to say what they want to say about that topic. And if that side is represented not by one lawyer or two lawyer or three lawyers, but has an entire prosecutorial team and you're just maybe an idiot, I mean, I'm just spitballing here, you're probably messing your trial up. Eh, I don't know. So those were pretty crazy, right? I mean, this is not how a lawyer would behave, and honestly, it's not how most pro se murderers behave, I think. There really aren't that many pro se murderers to compare him to, but he's really doing a great job. But I have been told that this next clip is way, way crazier. I don't know if that can be true, because so far, he's violated most of the rules that you and I know about human decency in interactions, and certainly rules about how you behave in a courtroom. Well, let's see what we got. <laughs> no, oh, we are no, back on way, the no way. Okay, <laughs> his shirt is off. I had been told. <laughs> Mr. Brooks be removed have, from the courtroom due to the I have been told uh, that this happens in this trial, uh, with the court, but I, I guess uh, I either didn't remember or I wasn't ready for it. <laughs> recent history with Mr. Brooks on every day that he's he just been in court pacing with his shirt off. Um, wow. A complete and utter Arr! for the simple um, rules of civility. Okay, this is not how we do it. Not surprisingly. So they've got him in an ancillary courtroom because I think I heard the judge say of multiple outbursts, etc. But he's just taking his shirt off and he's just kind of pacing back and forth. Now, I want to talk about shirtlessness in the courtroom. It doesn't happen a lot. I've never done it. There have been times I've wanted to, for sure, yeah, right? I mean, I'm human. It gets really hot in there sometimes. I don't think that's what this is about. They didn't have the thermostat set up to crazy, but it sure looks like they did. I don't maybe it's really hot in the ancillary courtroom. I don't know. So here's the deal. Years ago, everyone was wearing like just straight up wool suits to court, right? Like three piece suits with a vest and a jacket and everything. Well, it's not that way anymore. People, lawyers don't only wear suits. They'll wear like, uh, you know, pants and a jacket, but you always wear a tie. Women's attire has changed some over time. As recently as even 20 years ago, there were judges who would not allow female attorneys to wear pants suits in the courtroom. They were required to wear a skirt suit. I mean, I don't know. It's not really kind of the thing that I know very much about. All to say, things have gotten a little more informal over time, which I think is great. This is a bit much. I think fully topless. You know, we're not there yet. You know, not for women, not for men. I don't think we're doing that, except in this trial. He's got a COVID mask on, but no shirt. I, he could catch COVID like through his nipples, I think. I don't know. I'm gonna have to do some research on that. Um, he has been removed from the courtroom multiple times. This morning alone, he started interrupting this court within a minute of the court calling the case. Um, I should also make a record at, at the moment he is muted uh, because of the way that he was removed from the courtroom and his conduct since. Oh, I um, think I was muted for a second too. I've been too. given just a bit of information about it. I will advise everyone that I have required that the Sheriff's Department uh, file a written report with the court uh, regarding Mr. Brooks's conduct, I'm told that um, he would not sit down while in this courtroom in order to have the shackles removed so that he could be taken to the other courtroom, that he was resisting, um, that at one point he Oh, he just sat down on the desk. And it appeared, I mean, you're not supposed uh, to sit on the desk, the but at least he's not pacing. The shoe. <clears throat> Actually, I feel like I should tell you that the rules of courtroom decorum are so serious that one time, I had a trial in Denver, Colorado, a very long time ago, and I set my briefcase down on what's called counsel table. That's this thing right here. And the judge had not yet come into the courtroom. It was my first day to be in trial in front of that judge, and one of the courtroom deputies jumped up and was like, Mr. Sanford. Well, at that time, I was known as Mr. Sanford. I wasn't known as America's attorney, which is what I am now, which is a, uh, a really good time to remind you that you should subscribe to America's attorney. However, back then, Merely Mr. Sanford, he jumps up and he says, no, 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 uh, uh, it's a hundred dollar fine if your briefcase is on counsel table. What? This guy can sit shirtless with his butt on the table 
and I'm gonna get a hundred dollar fine if I set my briefcase on the table? Well, what if I have to get papers out of it? Do I need to go get under the table to get my papers? I'm telling you, that's a complicated rule and I'm not in favor of it. Wow, I have to say, my producers, all 12 of them were correct. That was the craziest clip from the trial. Now, you may disagree, and if you do, get down in the comments and drop your pro se opinion. What do you think? was the craziest moment in the trial. And if you agree with me, hey look, I have an ego, I'd love to hear that you agree. And because you have been a faithful and attentive viewer and made it to this point in the video, and because you've subscribed, you've liked, you've shared, you're celebrating with me, I am going to give you a special bonus clip because Candidly, it wasn't only Mr. Brooks who kind of lost their mind at one point. Thing worth noting is the testimony of Detective Casey that this video was obtained from the defendant's own Facebook account as well. The court is Objection. well aware. You said social There's media. You nothing didn't say, that. You didn't say well, it was. Sir, stop interrupting. We have to make a record of it. You've it the interrupted multiple times. I've been abundantly patient with clear. you. Again, another interruption. So you need to be quiet and let the state make a record. Stop gesturing at me. me to be quiet? Stop rolling your eyes at me. You Stop I'm mumbling. I'm looking right at you. I'm not rolling my eyes. No, you I'm have looking. throughout. I've seen I'm it looking. and I've made note I'm of it. I'm looking at you. Okay, so are you asking me to be quiet or are you telling me to be quiet? Go ahead, Attorney Opper. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm take and that just to you. indicate, Your Honor, <clears throat> this court has been abundantly patient with Mr. Brooks. He challenges the court's authority repeatedly. This court absolutely has the ability to tell him to sit down and be quiet. And you haven't done that. And I know why you haven't done that, Your Honor. And we appreciate that. He is not in control of this courtroom. You are. And he needs to respect that. Whoa. This video was relevant based on his questioning of Detective Casey, as you just indicated, challenging his ability to identify the person who had their back turned to the camera in the still shot of State's Exhibit 175. Trials are fluid. When he opened the door to that, we came up with the video which Detective Casey testified repeatedly on direct examination and cross-examination as to how he knew that was Mr. Brooks because he had seen the rest of the video. He would not accept that. He pushed it and pushed it and pushed it until we played the video. The lyrics of that video probably would have been prejudicial. Originally, I wasn't going to ask for volume. Then I did because he pushed it again, and his voice and his mannerism of speech, I thought, would have assisted the jury in identifying Mr. Brooks as the person in the video with the red SUV. However, you smartly asked me to play it without the audio and I did that and then I never went back to that. This is all to the benefit of this defendant who continues to suggest and impugn the integrity of this court and this prosecution without basis. He doesn't like it because the evidence is stacking up and stacking up and whenever it does, his response is to accuse you, the court, or the prosecutors of being unethical and hiding things. There is nothing in law that prevents me from pulling something out of my briefcase right now and making it an exhibit if it's relevant. You decide what's relevant, what's admissible, not Mr. Brooks. There is no law he can cite to no law, no authority whatsoever that says I can't make an exhibit essentially on the fly if it's called for and that's exactly what just happened here. So I apologize for my tone with the court. I don't mean to direct this at the court. It is very frustrating. The court has demonstrated much more patience than I have with Mr. Brooks because again I do not appreciate his impugning the integrity of these proceedings of your honor's efforts to run a fair trial and of our efforts to run a fair trial. We have ethical obligations as well to be fair in this courtroom. We have respected that entirely. The reason I was laughing 30 seconds ago was because the exhibit was mislabeled. There was an extra Y and it said Exhibit E, E-X-H-I-B-I-T-Y. 
And I turned around to the paralegal and pointed that out, and we laughed over it, the word exhibity. That was it. There has been no disrespect directed at Mr. Brooks directly in any fashion. So he can object all he wants, and he has made that clear. He will continue to object and obstruct the court and obstruct these proceedings every last chance he gets. But legally, everything has been above board and proper, and this exhibit is no exception. I apologize for my tone, Judge. Wow, so that was nowhere near on the level of Daryl Brooks, but that prosecutor was worked up. And why? Why was she worked up? You might have watched a lot of the trial online. You might have watched it on TV. You might have, like me, watched highlights of it. We can turn it down. We can turn it off. We can go away. But they're in the courtroom with someone who appears to have like narcissistic personality disorder or something like that. I don't know. I cannot imagine the stress and the strain on these prosecutors just day after day after day. Look, everyone knows that he was the driver. Everyone knows that he did it. But we have a court system that honors our processes in every situation. Because if we dishonor them in any situation, then we're all at risk. And so these prosecutors are just slogging it out day after day after day while Brooks is making everyone miserable. And I mean, maybe I'm supposed to get mad at her for kind of raising her voice a little bit, but I, I feel that. Pro tip for all you potential pro se participants in the court system out there. Don't have outbursts like Daryl Brooks or this could happen to you. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If I missed anything from the Brooks trial or there's something else that you think I need to cover, drop it in the comments below.